hands together and give me a warm welcome for Jackie Otero. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here at Hall of Fame 11 with us. And we're excited to have our panel today, networking in the tech industry. So please think of questions as we go. We would love to hear from you guys towards the end of the session. Um, let me introduce my, well, I guess let me start with introducing myself and then we'll go and meet the panel. My name is Jackie Otero and I'm the program director for the entertainment business and music business bachelor's degree programs here at Full Sail. My background is in the music industry, uh, but networking is a topic that I'm very passionate about and that I talk to my students about all the time. So I'm excited to be hosting this session with you all today. So let's go down the line and learn a little bit about our panelists. I'll just ask you guys if, when I introduce you, if you could just give me like a sentence or two summary of what you do, and then we'll dig into more details as we go. So to my immediate right, please welcome Michael LaPlante. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael, uh, front end development manager and principal engineer at Proforma. I'm in charge of a business management solution application and making sure that stays in production and deploying new features and applications for our uh, owners. All right, thank you, Michael. And next up to his right, please welcome Chris Kelly. Hey, everybody, I'm Chris. Um, thanks, everybody, for showing up today. This is great. Uh, I'm a uh, UX designer at Google. I work in immersive computing, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Very cool. And last but not least, uh, on the end of the row here, please welcome Albert Perez. Hi, I'm Albert Perez. I'm a 2005 game dev grad. Um, I work on immersive experiences, most uh, recently the HoloLens 2. So I create all kinds of cool demos that combine Azure and uh, the HoloLens. And in, just because I want to brag on them a little bit, um, Chris is getting inducted into the Hall of Fame this week. So hopefully you guys will all be there to see his induction um, happening tomorrow. And then Albert was an inductee back in Hall of Fame 8. And I'm sure Michael's a future one right here. So <laughs> keep an eye on him. OK, so let's talk about networking in the tech industry. Um, let's start off with, OK, it's day one at an industry conference. That's kind of what we're here for this week, too. It's like an industry conference here at Hall of Fame. So it's day one of an industry conference. Where do you start? What is your strategy? How do you tackle your own networking? Uh, so for me, I've done a, a little bit of pre-research. I've found the, the key people I want to talk to at that conference. And then I'll make sure I go up to them and I introduce myself. Uh, usually, I wait for a chance to find them in a group uh, because there's always somebody in that group that's probably wanting to get out of the conversation through their body language. Uh, so I'll go up and I'll introduce myself. Hey, I'm Michael. Uh, I've heard a lot about you, Chris. Uh, I see you do some really cool stuff at Google. Can you tell me more about that? And that leads right into the conversation from there. When you say you kind of observe their body language, what are you actually looking for? Uh, if their feet are pointed the opposite direction of where you're at, or their shoulders are turned the opposite oh. direction, or their eyeballs are going somewhere else than on you, that's usually a telltale sign that they kind of want to go somewhere else, or they're done with the conversation. OK, interesting. So you can spot that person in a group oh, and yeah. use that as your way in. Exactly. Okay, I call it my like magic that. number. I always look for a group of two or three people, at least. OK, very nice. Somebody's always looking to escape the group. I like that. <laughs> OK, how about you, Chris? <laughs> That's very strategic. I like that. Um, I think for me, I, I, I don't think I approach it quite so tactically. I think um, I'm, I'm a little more on the introverted side. So the first step for me is kind of uh, getting in the right state of mind and getting ready to talk to people that are strangers to me. Um, maybe there's some people that I'm familiar with from their backgrounds. But uh, for the most part, it's, it's getting in the mindset that like everybody here is here because they want to connect. Um, and so. You know, it's not like you're walking up to somebody random at a Starbucks. Um, so just being in that mindset that like, hey, we're here to connect. Everybody's excited and passionate about the same things. Um, leading with your passion and, you know, just trying to make organic connections and not so much, you know, being very specific about like, here's the thing that I do. How can we help each other? Um, you know, a lot of the fruit that bears down the road with connecting with people comes from making very real connections and friendships. Let me stop on just something that you said, too, about being an introvert. How many introverts in the room? <laughs> OK, that's a good majority. Um, and I think, I mean, at least it seems like possibly a stereotype in the tech industry that it is full of introverts, yeah, right. right? So what do you do to kind of pump yourself up a little bit to get out of that shell and, and try to go meet some new people? Because it's not an easy thing to do. No, it's, it's not. And, and I think um, 
there's, there's maybe like a perception shift that you have to make a little bit, which is that um, connecting with people and networking isn't about being like really bubbly and like super friendly and likable. Um, it's, it's about like uh, being approachable and caring and listening. Uh, you know, people love to talk. So if you get people going on a topic they're interested in and you're listening and asking questions, um, that's just as important as having the right thing to say at all times. In fact, quite a bit more important. Um, so for me, like getting into that mindset, a lot of, it's just uh, it's a little bit like a band-aid, you know? Like it, I, I've had times when I've showed up to events where I'll just kind of like find myself five or 10 minutes in and I'm checking my phone. It's like, oh, this thing's kind of like, maybe I should just go. And I'm like, no, that's not why I came here. Mm -hmm. And I just walk up to somebody, hey, I'm Chris. <laughs> you know? uh, because it's like, you have to get the ball rolling. Uh, and, and once you get it started into conversation, you do find that like, oh, all these people are here for the same reason. Right. Um, and, and it just kind of goes from there. I find that when I go to a networking event, if I go there with somebody I know, I end up just talking to them the whole time. Yes. So I know for myself, I sometimes have to just go to something by myself because yeah. it kind of forces me to I have to talk to somebody. Yeah. Right? Especially if you have like a very charismatic friend. It's so, right. e it's so easy to kind of uh, drift on their coattails a little bit socially, right. which sometimes works out because they can like break into these conversations, which sort of gives you a little easier entry. Mm -hmm. But you also don't want to use that as sort of like a reliance mechanism. Right. What do you think, Albert? Oh, we're a little bit reverse there, Michael. I, I actually like um, pairing up with someone who's actually that social butterfly, um, especially if it's early in the conference and, or maybe I don't really see a lot of people. Because what happens is you usually hook up with someone with you know, that you know. Um, and that's the first go-to to, to kind of get you in that mood. And usually it will be that person who's kind of social butterfly and kind of stick with them for a bit until I can kind of feel the conference. Because it's important to feel the energy, right? If you're coming in in the morning, guess what, right? People are waking up, they haven't had their coffee yet, or maybe they partied really hard the last uh, the night before. So you need to kind of read that energy. And if you're not good at it, find someone who can, and then go with them, or just stand around in the lobby, just talking to that person, make sure there's space for a person to come in, because guess what? It's gonna be like five, 10, 100 other people who are by themselves who just wanna talk. And if you have leave that little space, they'll just naturally drift in. And then you can kind of start from there and, and get the energy growing soon enough, you'll see your group kind of expanding. So it, it's one of the techniques I use. Yeah, that, that's great. I just one next thing on there. I, I think that's great. You're saying about leaving space for people. And the other thing to remember, like you saw everybody put their hands up, right? And most people are feeling the same way that they're not super comfortable joining conversations. So, you know, you will also be a person that somebody wants, somebody people want to come talk to. So being really responsive with your own body language of accepting people into a conversation or including people, oh, hey, what do you think about that? Or come join us. Um, you know, that, that if everybody does that, then all of the conversations happen much easier. So be really accepting and open to other people in the conversations. I love that because you can always look around and see the person who's kind of flying solo yeah. and bring them in, right? Or even that, that come here. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's easy. Great. So I know sometimes it can be hard for us to get to those industry conferences. They can be expensive. You know, um, it can be hard, especially for students who are on a tight budget to go to these conferences. Do you have any recommendations if you can't get to a conference in person? What kind of networking recommendations um, can you provide for remote networking? Okay. 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 <laughs> Let's go ahead, Michael. So one of the things I always do is I, I find people that may be at that conference that I wasn't able to attend personally, and I'll reach out to them through social media channels, mostly uh, Twitter, uh, or I'll find them on LinkedIn. Maybe I'll find their email, and I'll just shoot them an email and say, hey, I wasn't able to see you at Hall of Fame this year, uh, but I really like what you're doing. Uh, can you tell me more about what you're doing there? And uh, I'd love to see how I can help you in that process. Uh, and that's an easy, soft reach out. Uh, it shows you've done a little bit of research into what they're doing, uh, and then they have the opportunity to reach back out to you at their own pace, uh, so you're not bombarding them all at once. So you find Twitter to be a good way to do that? I did. I actually, when I was a student, uh, one of the instructors we had, Edward, he gave us that assignment. He said, go and find five industry professionals and reach out to them and just ask for their opinion, what it's like in the industry, uh, what are you doing? And I've kind of carried that through my entire career as I moved to different points. I'll reach out almost like for a mentor and just say, hey, I see you're uh, a director at this company. I'd love to get there in my career. Can you give me some tips on what you've done to, to get to that point? Are they usually pretty responsive? 
we're all human innately, so we all like to talk. And we like to talk about ourselves. So I've never really had anybody tell me, no, I don't want to tell you any of these things. Usually they tell me five, and then they tell me 15 more on top of those five. <laughs> Great. Yeah. No, so one thing, you, if, if you're doing that research, I think we have such a big alumni network that if you reach out to any full set alumni, they will 100% reach back to you like, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to help you. If you are kind of shy and, and don't think you can talk to other people yet, then rely on that full cell alumni network and then from there you kinda can feel and they can kind of tell you how to do things. So that's a good way to kind of break the ice. Do you have a certain platform you like to use for that? Do you email, do you use social media? Um, LinkedIn is a good place, but there's a lot of spam there mm -hmm. these days. Um, Twitter is usually the go-to spot because that's kind of like an in-between formal um, and you know uh, so, um, personal. Because Instagram's kind of weird because you don't even get those DMs sometimes. But Twitter is for sure the best kind of mid middle road. But it depends on your industry. Right? If your industry uses a lot of Instagram, let's say you're talking to an influencer on Instagram, well, obviously you're gonna use Instagram, right? So or or you can kind of stalk them a little bit. Where are they most active on? Because nothing's worse than trying to ping someone on LinkedIn if they never use it, but they're active on Twitter. So you just kind of need to figure that out. Um, one, one thing I would say is that, you know, there are these like ten pole conference events that, you know, people get excited about going to, and those are really fun to go to. But also don't underestimate the power of building professional connections more locally. Like whether it's looking up uh, local meetups on meetup.com, um, or even organizing your own, you know, you could you could build a meetup group here at Full Sail. Um, those can be really valuable. When I when I'm so I spent 12 years in Los Angeles and then moved up to the Bay Area uh, six years ago with no connections. Um, you know, I, I had already a pretty big established professional network in LA, but nothing in SF. So I was like, okay. So I started a meetup group. <laughs> uh, so I started like the Silicon Valley Motion Designers, and you know, a bunch of people showed up, and I made a bunch of connections, and um, those things. You know, the, the temple events are great, but in a more intimate environment, you can really connect with people, especially on a local level. For example, if you if you are if you if you're like, oh, I want to stay and live in Orlando, it's like, well, then you should be building professional connections here in Orlando, right? Um, and obviously, with the rise of remote work, it, it, it's easy to uh, work anywhere, really. But um, I think don't underestimate the power of building connections uh, even more locally than these big temple events. I'm assuming, do you use Meetup.com for that? Uh, I used to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how do you structure a meetup? If somebody wanted to try that out and start one up themselves, what do you do? I mean, you put it out there with a topic, and what do you, what yeah, do you actually do? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I had never, I had, that was the first one I had ever organized. I had attended a bunch, but I'd never organized one. And uh, so that was actually my biggest concern. I was like, what's going to happen? Like, all these people are going to show up, and they're going to have what expectations. Are we gonna do? Like, what are they going to expect? <laughs> And so I like stressed out about it a lot, actually. And then I like I went through like I made some outlines. I was like we could do this thing, and I could have somebody come in and do a talk. And, and I was like, that's like all too much. Like be made, who knows? Like I should find out what everybody wants to do first, right? Uh, you know, if you have somebody with an interesting topic to present on, like that can be cool because people's like, hey, come out. We're gonna give this 15-minute presentation on whatever, and then we're all just gonna chat. But really, people are showing up because they want to just connect. Uh, so, like for the one, uh, the ones that I've hosted, it's just like, hey, come out. We're just gonna sit around and talk. And people showed up, and you know, there's five minutes of awkward silence, and then people start talking, and then it's like, you know, 20 minutes later, we're deep into some conversation about like, oh yeah, well, you know, what is contracting work like in San Francisco? And um, people, you know, it just it can happen organically. You just have to like get people together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, Michael, you brought up mentors, too. Uh, I think mentorship, of course, we all talk about how essential it is, but it can be a little awkward to ask somebody to be a mentor. And you, it's like you don't really just walk up to somebody and say, will you mentor me? So how do you turn just a networking connection into a mentor? Uh, it's really easy. You can start out with just a, a simple coffee conversation and say, hey, uh, can, we, can I buy you a cup of coffee this morning? And uh, it's the soft touch. Uh, and as you continue to have those conversations with that person, it's an evolved relationship, or then they evolve and they take on that mentorship role. And it doesn't happen with everybody, and you don't want to force it. Some people don't want to be mentors. Uh, but the simple reach out of just, hey, can I, can I buy you a cup of coffee and talk about what you're doing? 
Uh, and then from there, you probably have something in common with them. The conversation continues to roll. Uh, and then you can say, hey, can we follow up in three months? And I'd love to, to hear what you do in those three months. And then from there, the conversation evolves and the check-in may be every six months, but just somebody that can, that can check you against yourself to see where you've come, because we're not always great about seeing where we've come from to where we're, where we're at now. Uh, so they can kind of act from that sense as just a, a safety check for yourself to tell you everything you've done and accomplished. Well, I would love to hear if you guys have mentors and if you have mentees, and how did you build those relationships? Um, I have a lot of mentors. Um, I would say a lot of them stem from the workplace. Um, you look up to certain people in the organization, might not be a direct boss, could be a coworker, could be someone who's above your boss on a different organization. Um, depends on, on really, and sometimes the companies that we work for, like Microsoft, has a formal mentorship program. So if you like get into a big company, you can ask, hey, is there a mentorship program? Especially if you're new to the area and don't know anyone, that's a great way to do it. Um, and for mentees, I actually have a lot of full sale grads and students reach out to me. Because every year we ask them, hey, reach out to us um, because we want to help you. And every single person who is visiting Hall of Fame is a person who wants to be a mentor because that's why they're here. And that's kind of how I collect my mentees. Um, but here's the trick. No, almost no one reaches out. Even when we ask, we give our email. You can Google us. We're not there to bite. So um, if you reach out, we will more than be happy to help you out on your journey. Um, and actually, one of my mentees, Lucas Moskun, um, he was very voracious in how he attended that. He, um, he was officially a mentee for me and literally was in every single panel I was in, in every single green room. I just got to spend a, a ton of time with him and, you know, and get to know him and, and really help him with personalized advice. And now he works for you know one of the biggest location-based uh, location-based experiences for VR, the Void, right? Um, he's working on that Star Wars thing, um, and because he spent the time to really research and 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 be there, he you know he got what he wanted, um, and and really it's just you just need to do it, you know that's the first step. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's. Uh it's absolutely true that very low percentage of people actually reach out. And then the, the trick is uh, just reaching out and touching base like that. That's not that it's not done. You know, the key, if you want to uh, get a mentor who hasn't been connected with you in some more like professional way, um, the key is like reach out. Uh, ask for something specific. Can I get feedback on this thing or I'm curious about what step I should take here? You know, the people that are here uh, this week have a lot of experience collectively, you know, and there will be a lot of things that you're going to go through that seem like totally foreign concepts to you that we've been through a hundred times. And it's pretty easy for us to say like, oh, like take a look at this or have you thought about this or maybe make this change and then do that thing and follow up again and say, hey, I did that and this is the result I got. Thank you very much. Or hey, it still didn't work. What should I do now? Because if you just reach out and then we give you some feedback and you don't do it and then you reach out again and it's like you didn't do anything with the last like people want to see that you are uh, listening and taking the things they say to heart and making those changes and those kinds of like fruitful relationships are really exciting for people even on the mentor side there's somebody i met uh five years ago at hall of fame six uh who reached out and then asked for some feedback gave him feedback made the changes and he just like we still stay in touch every couple of months, and he's just like, hey, here's what's going on in my life. I have this question about this thing. I have this interview coming up, and it's been great. And you know, the key is the follow-up and the feedback loop is really important. Mm -hmm. um, Albert, one of the topics that you've talked about before is having a smart professional lifestyle and having that kind of be part of your reputation. Can you tell us a little bit about your strategies for that? <laughs> um, so all, it all begins with your social media. Um, so do know that Twitter, a lot of game dev, if you're in game dev or tech, a lot of techies are in Twitter. So you need to keep that clean and, and talk about topics that you like. Um, because if you start you know, posting like weird stuff there, memes that really don't matter, then you're kind of diluting your brand. So 
that's the smart lifestyle is actually making sure that people perceive you a certain way, right, um, on the correct platform. So I have Twitter, which I talk about mostly tech. Instagram is about food. Uh, and then Facebook is where random stuff for my life. And obviously LinkedIn is for business, right? If you stick to those channels so people can listen to them, if they're interested in a particular thing, so they can kind of filter it out. So let's say someone's not interested in my food adventures, they, they can just kind of not follow me on Instagram, but they want to see tech uh, and you know, AR, VR, they can follow my Twitter. So that's kind of a little smart lifestyle. And also, in, in that sense, when I say branding, it's really about your reputation, right? Um, so anything and everything that goes in that bucket, you need to keep that reputation and make sure you're consistent, right? And that's where I have channels that kind of keep that reputation focused and consistent. Otherwise, people would just tune you out, especially if you're trying to build following or trying to build you know, people who don't really know you but want to know you or when they search for you, they can see those. So those are important. And to close that, there also there's your portfolio site. If you want someone to see who you are, you got to have a good clean, focused portfolio site. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're in UX or programming or music, if people go to your portfolio site and they see broken, slow website, then it's not, it's not impressive at all. And make sure it works on mobile, right? Because everyone's gonna look at you, it's probably gonna be on mobile. And so many personal portfolio sites I've seen look janky and, and on mobile, but are okay on desktop. So just be careful with those things. Any advice from you guys about maintaining that professional reputation? How you can be presenting yourself in a good light out there? I think um, when you're first getting into the industry, uh, it's really important that you're putting the, the face forward that you know people will build perceptions um, when you're not there, right? Uh, and that's oftentimes a lot of your online presence is going to be about uh, per perception building and sort of storytelling. And w if, if your dream comp like imagine that the creative director from your dream company went and to, uh, like heard, heard about you somehow and wanted to look up more information about you, like what are they going to see? And what do you want them to see? Um, because you're not going to be able to be there to like control the narrative, right? Uh, and so just being sure that you're putting the right face forward, that if you're, you know, for example, want to get into the motion graphics industry or the UX industry that you have up to date uh, content sites, you're participating in the content platforms that are sort of canonical for that, uh, that part of the industry. Um, for me, when I was first getting in the industry, and obviously it's a very different landscape now, but uh, finding out like what are the online communities um, that the people who are working in the industry are participating in and participate there. Uh, actively, don't just consume. Uh, be a producer, don't just be a consumer. It's so easy to passively consume and give yourself the perception that that is participating in the community, um, but it's not. And I think um, also leveraging the platforms uh, in the ways that they were designed for can be really effective as well. So for example, on Instagram, you know, if, if I were trying to break into the industry and I was like a character animator or something, like why not just create uh, a new piece of uh, a new account, and you're just posting content to that all the time, right? Uh, you, then that way you have this sort of like live stream of up to date information, uh, of up to date content that you've been creating. Um, you give people a place to consume the stuff that you're making and become top of mind. You look at uh, there's this uh, this guy. He goes by Beeple. You know, a lot of you probably heard of him. Uh, but like I remember, I don't even know how long ago it was. 10 or 12 years ago, 15 years ago, he was like just starting, and he had like never even done a lot of um, animation and motion graphics stuff. He was like getting really excited about it, you know, and now, and he's been posting stuff daily, I think, for the last like 12 years or something, which is, I mean, that's prolific, right? Like nobody does that. And now he's got like two or three million followers on Instagram. It's like, it, it's like if you are contributing and creating, people will consume and, and build perceptions of you, and, and that's, that's how you want to approach it. Great. Michael, anything to add? What do you think about how do you maintain your professional reputation? I think storytelling and relatability are super important too. Uh, 
just a, like you're introverted at a conference event and you're scared to go out and talk to them in person, there are a lot of people that are scared to make that first introduction online on your personal profiles. So if you can show some relatability, uh, if we're tweeting out about anything we're doing in tech, maybe a problem you're experiencing, there's probably somebody else that's experiencing that problem. So that's a relatability point that then is a easier touch point for them to reach out as well. Are business cards still important in your industries that you network in? Not with the coronavirus going on right now. <laughs> it, it, it is, um, but it is something, I think a little bit more on the formal side at this point. Um, usually, if you have a badge, maybe take a photo of it um, if, if you're trying to get to them. But it, it is still a reminder, but it, it is a problem because a lot of times at the end of the day at conference, you get a stack of business cards. So a lot of people still kind of go through that. At the end of the day, they'll take the stack, or maybe they've already split it as they kind of stored it. They'll be the ones that they throw out because they didn't want to connect with those and those that they think there's a connection. But also that comes into the actual physical part of the business card. Sometimes it's actually worth it to spend that extra money to do that business card, but make sure that business card actually reflects who you are and it's consistent when you talk to them, so that when they look at it, like, oh yeah, that person I talked to, because a lot of that's subliminal when you're looking at the business card, and if there's a disconnect between your personality and the business card, then they're like, who is that person? I don't know, I'm gonna put that in my discard pile, or just chuck it straight to the trash can. But it is still an important piece, but it, I, it's becoming less and less with, with that, because you can say, hey, just search me on Instagram, or. Twitter, or maybe if they've done their research, they already follow you, so you don't really need to do that um, kind of business card thing. Yeah, I, it's a necessary evil. I hate business cards. They're like, I have them. Uh, actually, don't have any with me because the reasons you've outlined. Uh, but I think, you know, it's like uh, you'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it, you know? And um, I've got, I've left conferences or talks uh, with a stack of business cards that get thrown in my laptop bag and then recycled in six weeks because I forget where they came from. Um, but at the same time, even just this week, I've been like chatting with somebody and I'm like, oh, we both have to go. And I just, I almost felt myself say like, oh, do you have a card just so I can like get it? Because right. I just like, it's this really quick, like low cost in terms of like, uh, you know, like the human cost of it. Uh, it's a really low cost way to just give people a little lifeline to get back to you. Um, so I don't know, I'm kind of mixed on them. It, it doesn't hurt to have them if you, you know, they're pretty cheap to get now if you go on moo.com or something and you just, you know, put some info on a card. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's tough. I find them really super useful. Like Elbert said, inside of the industry, we just want to take a picture of your badge uh, or something that you have at the conference. But it's really useful if you're networking with people outside of technology, mm -hmm. like potential clients that you want to work with, because in their industries, business cards are still super important. So having them for those purposes makes it worthwhile. That's yeah, a that, that's point. a great point with the, the client relationships, I think it's yeah. the same thing. Mm -hmm. So when you first meet somebody at a conference or at a place like Hall of Fame, what are the first things that you get, that you use to get an impression of somebody? Whether it's positive or negative, what are the things that you notice in a first impression? Uh, to me, it's, are you listening? Uh, how many people out there, uh, the minute somebody starts talking to you and you're already engaged in conversation, you're already thinking of your next question, mm -hmm. which means you're not actively listening to the things they're talking about. Uh, if you spend and wait the next 30 seconds and just let them finish their thought piece, pause for two or three seconds, and then ask your question, they're gonna realize that because you're, you're not formulating something in your head already, you're paying attention to everything that they're actively talking about. So that's one of the big things I do is I try to actively listen when I'm in conversations and then formulate questions or opinions afterwards. That's a great tip because sometimes you do get into your head a little bit while somebody's talking, you're like, what am I gonna say next or, what, you know? So it's good to kind of stay in the moment and Awkward pauses are okay in between <laughs> conversations. I know everybody's always like, well, we just have to keep the conversation going. It's okay to take two or three seconds. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the essence of the question of like, uh, what makes, what gives me the perception that this person is somebody I want to connect with? I think seeing the way they sort of like treat people. So like if you're in a conversation, you know, ask people if there's several people in the conversation and there's people who are dominating the conversation. Not everybody is as comfortable piping up or interrupting or jumping in. Include other people in the conversation that are standing with you like, oh, blah, 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 blah. What do you think? 
right? Or, or have you experienced anything like that? Pulling people into the conversation, not just like physically like we talked about earlier, but actually during the discussion, making sure that you're hearing from everybody. That, that's a way, I think, to build a lot of goodwill with the people that you're chatting with. Uh, it shows that you care. It shows that you're paying attention, right? Um, I think the listening thing is really critical as well. Uh, it's so easy to, and you, you can feel that happening in conversations where it's like, it feels like it's going from topic to topic because everybody's just talking about the thing they wanted to talk about. Um, but if you're actually actively listening, you're going to have follow-up questions because we're humans and we know how to communicate with each other, right? So just actively listen, be interested, and be genuine. I think it goes a long way. A lot of times I look at someone and kind of judge them. Kind of hard not to, right? We're humans. We're visual. Um, so if I look at you... and it's kind of hard, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but it's easy for professionals to see who's a student and who's not. Um, and it's okay, right? Because you're a student, if, if you dress like a student, there's many reasons why, and it's not your fault. Um, but people can sniff that. So if you're trying, if you're a student saying, oh, I'm a professional, most professionals are like, mm, you don't dress like the industry. Uh, you're not someone we're used to. So be mindful of that, because people will kind of scan you up and down. It's kind of like mean girls, but you know, we're not trying to be mean, right? We're just trying to judge, how do I approach this? Is this a student? Is this a professional? And there's a lot of psychology of how you bucket that thing. So just be conscious of how you're perceived, and then it makes it easier to kind of do those, you know, first meetups. And, and to add to your thing, like directing the traffic, especially if you're in a conversation and you kind of seem to realize that there's this one person dominating, you can kind of run a little bit of interference and do the direct chat. Oh, what do you think? To, to, to kind of break that guy from just keep um, speaking or, or girl. Uh, and a lot of times it's not their fault. They're just maybe just nervous and trying to get out all their thoughts. But if it's disrupting the whole conversation flow for the group, then people will start turning away and, and looking away and, and running away from the conversation, especially if you're trying to keep that group there so you can have a better bond. So it's up to you to actually help the conversation too. It's not just professionals like help someone out if they're in trouble kind of thing. Do you have any tips on behavior on how you can project yourself as a professional versus like kind of being noticed as like, oh, you're the student in the room? Because I don't think you're just talking about age. No, no it's right? not age, no. What are, what are the behaviors or things that maybe they could practice? It, it's something as easy as your hands. A lot of students I see fidget and kind of don't stand still. Um, and sometimes it's not your fault, right? It, it could be a behavioral thing. But be mindful if you're crossing your arms. You might be feeling, you're actually feeling cold because conferences can get cold and you're doing this and you know, I'm, I don't want to talk to you, right? Or you know, doing this or power move. No one does this in a conference, but you know, if you're doing power, <laughs> power moves, like you know, be careful of that. Um, and, and really, just be open, right? And be genuine. It's in the eyes too. When you look at someone and you're like, genuinely like, I'm a kid. I'm like, wow, you're, what you're saying is is awesome. And you have to feel it, right? Because fakeness is the worst thing. Yeah. People will detect fakeness, especially maybe in the beginning. Like, eh, is this guy true or not? But eventually, people will figure it out. So just be genuine, and I think everything will kind of flow through that way. I, I think, yeah, I, I think um, it's OK to be a student, you know? Uh, learning is a really, really good thing. Like, in a way, like, we're all still students, right? Uh, learning stuff all the time. And so I, I think the, the piece of that that's important is, like, your listening to, uh, your listening ratio should be uh, aligned with your experience ratio. And so if you're in a group with professionals and, and you know, you probably want to be asking questions more than you want to be making statements generally, just because there's a lot to learn, right? Like if I'm talking, to, I mean, I still encounter people all the time with way more experience than me. And, uh, you know, I try as, often, as much as I can to be curious and ask questions and, and try to learn from their own experiences. Um, because you you can shortcut experience in a lot of ways. And, and one of the best ways to do that uh, is to uh, be engaged with and listen a lot to people with experience. I think Albert hit it, hit it on the head with uh, being genuine. Uh, I know I always go into a lot of these conferences and every, everything as a student. Uh, I go there because I want to learn. 
I don't go there as a subject matter expert. Even if I'm a speaker at an event, I'm still a student because there's somebody else there that's probably smarter than me that I can learn something from. Mm -hmm. Uh, so going in with that mindset and understanding that and having that open body language, you're not turned to the side, your shoulders aren't somewhere else, your head's not on a swivel, and you're just paying attention, uh, those go a really, really long way. So to add to that, too, um, make sure if, if you want to say something, ask a, ask a question first. Because a lot of people, when you ask a question, they, they feel like, oh, he asked a question, I should ask a question back. And it's more, that per, if a person asks a question, it's more receptive. If you just come up to someone and say a statement, isn't that weird? You're like, whoa, what did you say? Why did you do that to me? But if you ask a question, that kind of butters up the conversation and they'll ask, naturally ask your conversation back. And usually, it'll be a mirror. They'll just ask, oh, what do you think? And then you can kind of mm -hmm. come in and make your statement. So that's a good way to start a lot of these conversations. And, and I think, you know, there, there's like, a lot of times, like we were talking about earlier, people show up to these kinds of uh, events because they want to be connecting with other people. But you also get these really exhausting set of uh, like canonical questions about like, what do you do? Where are you from? Like, and those, those are good openers. Um, but consider things that are a little more uh, human or approachable. Like, hey, what are you really excited about right now? Like everybody has something they're excited about, right? Uh, and generally, especially in a professional environment, maybe the thing that they're excited about is related to their profession. And those, those, those kinds of more genuine lines of questioning, there's nothing wrong with asking people, like, where are you from? How long have you been here? When do you head back? Like, those things, are, I've used them all week. Um, but if you're really trying to connect with somebody on a deeper, more genuine level, getting to things that are a little, like, softer, like, uh, what, what people are excited about are great. Yeah, kind of the joke is that you talk about the weather, right? So like find something yeah. more interesting <laughs> than the weather to talk about. Yeah. How has networking um, helped you find your way into your current role? Has it had any direct impact? Like have you gotten your jobs from networking? How has it played into it? So I have two stories here. Uh, the first story, uh, I was at a networking event when I first moved to Tampa Bay. Uh, I talked with many people at the networking event. I gave out many business cards. Uh, I stayed in touch with a few of the people. And two years later, uh, they actually had the perfect job opening. They said, you're the perfect candidate. We've stayed in touch. I'm going to submit you to this application. This is one of those that they're never going to post the job application. Like, you have to know somebody to get in. Uh, so I got hired in that position. And uh, currently, where I'm at at Proforma, uh, now I know this. Uh, but f the CEO said she was basically recruiting me two years before they hired me because they had heard from other people that I had networked with about my experiences and what I was good with in technology. So they were trying to find a way to, to get to me, to talk to me, and, and bring me in the door. Awesome. Yeah, I actually, uh, my, my role at Google came directly from networking, so I, um, but in a pretty like casual and informal way. So. Uh, like I said, I had spent a long time in Los Angeles building a, a career in, in sort of like commercial animation, motion graphics. Um, and when my wife got a job in the Bay Area, I was like, I had this moment of like, I think I'm gonna, I want to move into technology. Um, and so uh, I was standing in the kitchen at a studio uh, with a, somebody I'd, been, I'd known for many, many years. He was another freelancer. And we just got to talking. And he said, oh, I heard you're moving. I said, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, you know, uh, I knew that he had freelanced at Apple. And I said, um, oh, you spent some time up there. You know, any, any advice? Did you, did you like being at Apple? And, and he said, oh, you know, whatever, whatever. But I, I, he's like, actually, I met this guy when I worked at Apple. And now he's at Google, and he loves it. Like, you should connect with him. Let me give you his information. And so then I moved up. And you know, three months later, I, uh, we find the timing worked out. And I went and had lunch with him. Uh, he was at YouTube at the time. I went and had lunch with him at YouTube. We hit it off. He ended up referring me for a position. And then three months after that, I finally had closed it. And, uh, and that's how I ended up at Google. So you, know, you never know when these serendipitous moments of just uh, non-intentional connection can be made, right? Like, I was just getting a cup of coffee. And I just happened to talk to this guy. And we ha just got on the topic. And that's because we had worked together for 10 years and just had a real human connection. And we knew each other were reliable. And, uh, so that's the key is it's like making human connection, being reliable, being reputable. People will, uh, people will suggest you for roles or reach out to you if you have a good reputation. It's, it all adds up together. It's not one watershed. Sometimes it's one watershed moment. But generally, 
uh, you know, your career isn't built on like these singular watershed moments. It's built on uh, a reputation and it's built on a body of work and reputability uh, that gives you uh, the sort of clout to get shopped around, if you will. Like nothing scares an employer more than the unknown. And if you are an unknown person, like you don't go out, connect or, you know, network, then you are unknown to them. And it doesn't matter if your resume says 10 years experience, because you don't, the employer does not know if that experience is real. You could put fake information in there and then fool them. But, um, and that's why we have references and that's why every single person, hiring manager is more likely to talk to a person that they, that someone else that they know or was referred to them because, oh, I trust this person and they think this person is cool, then my time is not wasted. Uh, a hiring manager has to go through so many job, uh, job applicants from the open websites, but they would always prefer someone that was, pref uh, that was referred to them because it's already been filtered. So that's why it's important to be prolific in how you're out there. And that's where the genuine part comes in as we kind of circle around this is like, you need to be a genuine person so that people actually like working with you because nothing burns bridges more than being that person that no one wants to work with for various reasons. And sometimes it's unavoidable to burn bridges, but it is true, you never burn bridges. You always exit with grace because you're gonna need that connection. You're gonna need that um, network to kind of get you that job. And a lot of my jobs that kind of come back fast are jobs that I went through um, a referral rather than a cold application because AI literally will filter you out if you don't have enough keywords, even though you know I'm perfect for this job, but if your resume is not perfect, is not set up properly for the AI to read, there's no way you can get past that, but you can circumvent that by actually going straight to the hiring manager. So that's something you have to kind of worry about these days. Great. I've seen, I've seen yeah. people land contract work sight unseen because somebody that the person really trusts says, oh, this person's great. You got to get them in here. And they're like, okay, book them. Mm -hmm. like, don't, don't even need to see it. Somebody that I trust said that they're great. Get them in here. Mm -hmm. We would love to take some questions from you all. And I'm, I know we have a, a microphone around the room. If you could wait for that to get to you, please raise your hand if you have a question for our panel. We've got one up here and one over here. I want to YouTube. Here we go. Yeah, we got okay. YouTube. Uh, hello. Um, so Courtney Thomas from the Media Communications joining us from uh, YouTube today. Uh, and they had a question, actually two, uh, so if we get to one for the general panel. Um, let's see. So how do you ask someone to be a mentor if they live in another state? And if they do live in another state or you live in another state, is it unprofessional um, to ask that of somebody? Hi, Courtney. Uh, no, not at all. I think that goes back to uh, just the soft touch points. A lot of my mentors have just evolved from simple conversations. Uh, sometimes my mentors are in the technology industry. Other times they're in totally unrelated industries because you want experiences from all these different places and they all kind of blend together when it comes to technology. Uh, so simple conversations. And if we've been talking for a year, I just say, hey, can we make this a more frequent thing? Uh, you've got some great experiences. Maybe we can make this a normal conversation. And we don't even label it a mentee-mentor relationship. We just label it even a friendship. A lot of friendships are mentor-mentee relationships as well. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And the other thing is like, the you know, earlier we talked about the feedback loop of like if you're getting guidance from somebody and you apply that guidance and let them know you applied the guidance, like that is in many ways the mentorship, mentee, mentee, uh, mentor relationship. And so that, that is location agnostic. You can do that from anywhere. In fact, the person that I mentioned, we've never lived in the same state. Um, we're almost strictly on email. We've talked a few times on the phone if we have something deeper to dive into. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's more about the feedback loop than it is about uh, proximity. Thank you. Got a couple hands up up here. Uh, 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Montanez. I'm a game master's degree student, um, a game design master's degree student, sorry. Uh, my question is, um, for someone who is not big on social media, um, what advice can you give on how best to, I guess, uh, build up their social media presence professionally? So in the game industry specifically, you just talk about your game. Uh, create a social media account that reflects you and obviously make it professional or maybe a little whimsical but never really out of the normal, then that's the first thing because that's the hashtag, right? Uh, or not hashtag, your handle. Um, and then just post about your games. Like, uh, hey, I made this indie thing or this thing, here's a screenshot. Or or you can start, there's a lot of hashtags on, you know, uh, screenshot Saturday or throwback Thursday and start participating in those. Um, and even if it's small or if someone's tweeting something, you can just reply um, or ask a question. And that's kind of how you build it. And a lot of it's feel, right? You gotta feel the indie community, feel the game community and follow the people who are actually active in the industry and participate in that conversation. You never know, you just want, there's this guy you've been following for like five years or maybe a big fan. If you tweeted them, they might actually reply back if they're not a busy person or they might actually like your reply, they like it and there's like an endorphin effect there. Like, oh man, he replied and that's awesome. And then maybe you can even build a conversation from that. So just do it. I mean, that's, that's the really the first thing you need to do and then kind of be smart about it, right? Uh, think about what you're doing, but don't overthink it at the same time. All right, thank you. Hello, my, my name is Brandon Cessna. I'm in the game dev degree. Um, I'm doing final project right now. Um, so to piggyback off of his question, um, as a game developer, uh, it seems like posting on social media is a bit different than like game art. You can just kind of post your art, it'll be interesting. Um, but I guess it can kind of feel like I'm not doing anything like revolutionary um, in my project, even it might be kind of cool to me. Um, it seems like it wouldn't be interesting to other people, but I guess it could be. So what is your thoughts on like just posting what you're doing, even if it's not, you know, really groundbreaking? So I can, I can take this one. One of the, one of the biggest things that I did, uh, Probably somebody has done it before, but if you write about it, like through a blog post maybe, somebody will come and reference that. Uh, I've wrote a few blog posts that years later, I've run into the same problem and I've circled back and landed on my own blog post. Um, uh, I also did this thing uh, through a GitHub repo uh, ourselves, uh, things I learned, just to kind of keep track, like, hey, I learned this new thing, and I posted that. And then that's a, a track record, so somebody else can then reference that. Uh, just because it's not the most interesting thing or somebody else has already solved it, doesn't mean you can't help somebody coming behind you. Um, so it's always important to document what you're learning, because you never know, you could be helping yourself in the future, like in my case. In, um yeah, I think that's great. And, and I would add to that, like, um, don't gatekeep yourself by saying the things you're doing are not interesting because there's a lot of people in the world with a lot of different kinds of interests. And the people who are working on the things that you want to work on are probably interested in the kinds of things you're interested in. And so um, another thing that, you know, when you're hiring people, you know, if you made it in the door, like for an interview, you're probably capable of doing the thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the door. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand like how people work, how people think, how they approach problem solving and design problems, uh, on my side at least. And so if, if you think about can you create uh, an environment where people can see your growth and they can see the kind of thinking that you do. So as you progress through these things, posting updates are like, hey, here's the thing I'm working on. I'm, I'm working on this piece and it's kind of hard. Like, first of all, you probably get some tweets back. They're like, oh, try this or try that. And then you post an update and it's like, hey, I got past that one thing, this is what I did, and now I'm working on this. Like, that's actually really interesting for people and for people who are looking for somebody like you, they'll see that track record and that growth and it's a, it's a clear sign of velocity and uh, curiosity that is really important for employers to see. So one last thing, um, you don't, your tweets don't need to be home runs, right? It's like, just tweet something and don't expect, don't. You don't have to have the expectation that a thousand people will like it or even someone might like it. Just put it out there. It's, it's fine. 
and someone can just, like you said, look at what you've tweeted and they might find it interesting when they do a search and they can engage from there. So you're basically leaving breadcrumbs for yourself. Mm -hmm. Even think about you being at final project and you're getting ready to graduate. I mean, how exciting is that to somebody who's in month one or two of your program? To you, it's not groundbreaking, but to them, they're like, wow, he's at the very end. Or even somebody who's a year away from starting at Full Sail, and, and this is what they wish that they could study. To, so to somebody, it is groundbreaking, even if it's not to you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it helped. Uh, hello, my name is um, Aiden Rogers. I am a recent graduate from the Game Design Bachelor's Program. Um, I am the type of person that often reaches out to people and things of that sort, but it's all, all more often than not, it sometimes just falls dead, and I would want, and sometimes I would, I'd want to like reignite that connection and just talk to them a little more because I was really interested in talking to them. Um, can you give me some tips and whatnot to probably like be able to talk to them again and like something that I can like bring up or something or something of the sort of how to like reignite that conversation and keep the ball rolling? I would say, um, you know, there's a few reasons something like that might happen. Maybe the person's busy. Maybe it's just they aren't that social or don't want to connect. That happens, you know, like if you reach out to 10 people, is you're probably not gonna connect with 10 people in the long term, you know, but maybe one out of 10. Um, and so I would say if there's somebody specific that you wanna reignite chat with, um, think about like, is there anything new that you're working on? Is there any guidance that they gave you that you wanna follow up on? They're like, hey, I did this thing you said. People love that. Like, you know, people wanna know that the value, that, that the things they're saying to you are valuable or if they're providing you guidance that it's valuable. Or if you've seen something new that they've done, using that as kind of an end, like, hey, I saw this new project come from the studio, like, beautiful work, I love this, I've actually been working on something similar, you know, take a look. Um, I, I think, you know, m thinking about it not so much as like, is this sort of the tactical connection that I can reignite, and more like, what is a really human way to connect with this person and, and make them restart this conversation? And maybe it just falls on the floor again, and it's like, okay, you know, I'll reach out again at some point, but you know, maybe this just isn't a connection that's going to happen. Also happens occasionally, but if you just keep reaching out, be persistent, um, and be thoughtful, and uh, make sure that they see that there's a feedback loop happening if they're giving you guidance is really important. We like to say as humans, we're always busy. Uh, and there's obviously certain truth to that. Um, one of the things I like to do is immediately when I meet somebody, whether we exchange business cards or have a conversation, I'll send them an email within 24 hours. And I'll just say, hey, great, this is what we talked about. I love this conversation. I'd love to follow up. Uh, if I don't hear anything back immediately, I'll usually follow up within 14 days and just say, hey, uh, I know we, we were at this conference. Do you have some, some time to follow up on this chat? And then from there, maybe in three months down the road, I follow up again. Uh, and eventually, uh, we're all working on cool and interesting projects. They could be in the depths of like a, a tight deadline and they just can't respond or they could get hundreds of emails a day. Uh, so sometimes it just gets filtered through. Like in the morning, not everybody wants to go through two or 300 emails every day, so they just, Delete them all. Um, <laughs> so getting that chance just to be filtered through to the right channel appropriately, uh, sometimes that's all it takes. It's not a, a personal vendetta against yourself. It's just you didn't get the email in at the right time or they were super busy in a deadline and by the time they're done with the deadline, they forgot. Hello, my name is Jeremy Weidinger. Um, I graduated from the, uh, bat the computer animation bachelor's program. Um, and my issue is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I came here today because it seems my problem is I've, you know, 12 years in the military, um, bachelor's degree, and then on top of that I have uh, uh, CompTIA certifications, network security and all that. But I always have a problem trying to get a job. It seems like most places they want you to have the experience before you get hired. Um, so I guess from what I'm getting from everybody is just, I mean, not only do the applications, but networking is a very important thing. Any advice on any of the uh, good places to start with the networking, especially with the tech stuff? Uh, you can start with your local meetups. I think that, especially in the area you want to live in or work in, 
because a lot of those people will show up in those meetups and that's how you do it. Um, there's also a lot of Facebook groups. Um, you just need to search them and those are pretty busy a lot of times and you can kind of connect from there. Uh, and in terms of experience, just do your own projects. And that's what I tell everyone and that's how I do it too is work on side projects, especially if you're trying to sidestep to a different part of your career or you know, just showing. Because as an animation graduate, right, you live and die by your portfolio. And if I look at your portfolio right now, will I say, I want to hire this guy? Or like, well, where's your stuff? Or you know, this guy isn't really putting effort into your portfolio, especially if you be hired, if you want to be hired. But if you have some you know, really great, greatly done portfolio, you will definitely get a call back because people want to hire. There's always someone that needs animation and motion out there. You just need to really impress them. Yeah, I, I would say also, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about being a producer. I think Facebook groups is a great idea. There's probably subreddits that are interesting and active. Participating in those and posting work in them and showing that you're like actively developing this skill set continually. Um, you know, that, that changes you from like an email with a link or an attachment in it to somebody who's like making and creating and uh, other people may even be consuming your work. Um, and, and that sort of changes the dynamic a little bit. Uh, so it's more from like a push method to a poll. Uh, and uh, so I would say I think the meetups idea is a great thing as well. Uh, and also like just be ready to say yes and be open for opportunity. The, the first thing that you land might not be exactly what you had in mind. Um, but uh, we talked a little bit in a panel yesterday about, you know, be, be attached to your goal, not so much the path that you'll take to get there, because you, pro you may have a path in mind that like, this is how my career is going to go. It's probably not going to go like that. Mine didn't go like I had the path in my head. Uh, and so you just have to be dynamic and just keep chasing the sort of North Star that you have set for yourself uh, and be flexible and put yourself into situations where you, you can say yes to opportunity. I'd say you're already networking. You're here today. That's doing more than a lot of people that aren't. So I think you already have a leg up. And then, yeah, the paths are not straight, for sure. Um, and then as far as your experience goes, working on personal projects, I mean, what, what really constitutes as experience? It's anything. It's writing a blog post that talks about something interesting you're learning in animation today. Anything like that can be constituted as experience. You worked on projects while you were a student. To me, that's experience. Uh, so you already have some of that experience. So don't be afraid to, to reach above what you think you can reach. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'd add is, is that uh, ex you'll find that after you've been in the industry for a while that the skill set to do the thing is only a portion of what it actually means to like, be a professional in the environment. And so you know, you're 12 years in the military. There is so much valuable experience there for you about you know, working with people and being in a dynamic with groups and, and, you know, that is so valuable for a professional. And so you actually have quite a leg up in many ways. Um, and and the getting known as an animator is like, that's, that's the piece that you got to build. Um, but the rest of it, you actually have a lot of experience built already. And remember what they said at the very beginning, too, is how few people actually follow up with them. So you guys are in this room. Let's see if uh, let's see how many emails they get after this. <laughs> They're putting themselves out there for you guys. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you so much to Michael, Chris, and Albert. I think they gave a lot of practical advice today. So hopefully you guys can go out there and use it. Good luck to you all. Enjoy the rest of Hall of Fame. Good luck. <laughs>